good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of the participants of this learning lab. Uh, my name is Anna Maria Bogdanova. Uh, I am a disaster risk management specialist in the World Bank in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. And I have a privilege to be the facilitator of today's session. We have all gathered today to talk and to learn about what the transition to impact-based forecasting means for stronger multi-hazard early warning services in the Caribbean. And clearly the focus of the concept is in the word impact, uh, focusing on impact of the hazards, especially on the impact uh, for those who may be particularly exposed uh, will lead to better understanding and articulating of potential risk and appropriate actions. We will have a keynote presentation made by Dr. David Farrell, principal of the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. Dr. Farrell brings many years of experience in scientific, administrative, and educational, um, and many other areas related to hydromet events in the Caribbean. Um, his presentation uh, will then be followed by a breakout group session where participants will have a chance to discuss and share the views uh, on the practicalities of the transition to the impact-based forecasting challenges and opportunities uh, that open up in this process. Uh, the outcomes of which discussions will be posted on a shared document uh, that will be presented during the panel discussion and exchange of views, which will wrap up this learning lab. Um, as I mentioned, house rules are very simple. Um, if you're not making an integration, please keep your mics muted. Um, all the views are um, open and um, ideas are welcome. Uh, be respectful of the views of the others. Uh, interpretation to Spanish, English are available, um, and feel free to turn on your camera whenever you want. Um, with this, I am delighted to pass the word to Dr. Farrell. Uh, David, over to you. Uh, thank you, Anna Maria, and uh, good morning to everyone. I will bring up my presentation. Uh, And uh, well, I was told to really start this presentation from the end with conclusion. So I'll say thank you for, for attending this presentation. Uh, this is going to be essentially almost like a Quentin Tarantino movie in that I'll start at the end just so that everyone kind of gets a picture of where we're going and then I'll try to tell a story. Uh, First off, impacts-based forecasting is new and it's revolutionary. And in some ways it will evolve over time. And so it becomes evolutionary. It has the potential to save lives, livelihoods and economies. And climate and uh, hydromet agencies are moving in this direction already in the Caribbean. It is multidisciplinary and requires broad partnership, coordination and collaboration. While it is technical, and requires us to predict when, where, uh, how long, et cetera. It also recognizes that we need to uh, build communi uh, complex communication uh, skills uh, and to communicate in simple language that maps onto our cultural and social constructs. And that's important if we're going to get the message across to people about what they're supposed to do uh, because we're moving away from the traditional paradigm of simply forecasting a hazard to really what the impact of the hazard uh, will be. Uh, because it is new, there is plenty of opportunity for innovation. There's plenty of opportunity for young people to engage and for gender uh, sensitive issues to be integrated uh, and discussed. So my presentation is going to uh, highlight uh, some advancements that we've made in the region. Uh, through partnerships uh, with development partners such as USAID, uh, with partners such as US National Weather Service, WMO, uh, et cetera, and of course, regional institutions. And so I will start uh, obviously with, oops. So I'll start with the, um, uh, see if I can get this out of the way. There you go. So I will start with the, um, with the fact that the 
Caribbean islands are exposed to a range of, of natural hazards that coupled with their inherent vulnerabilities can individually or in combination significantly impact uh, single states, multiple states, uh, cause and loss of life, livelihoods, et cetera. And these will be uh, exacerbated by climate change and increasing climate uh, variability, as well as uh, poor uh, unregulated uh, development. And so robust people-centered early warning systems are required. And here uh, on the left, I'm showing a, a picture of the range of uh, natural hazards that we have in the region. Uh, certainly we have hydromet, uh, climate, geological and marine uh, hazards that we have to deal with. And they're all interconnected. They all intersect in different ways and all four may intersect in some way, uh, shape, form or another. Um, in terms of multi-hazard early warning systems, uh, most of us are familiar with what these are, but multi-hazard warning, early warning systems are able to address multiple hazards or, and or impacts of different types. Uh, this is important uh, in a lot of ways because traditionally we've focused on singular events and a single hazard without necessarily looking at how these things are coupled together, how they cascade over time and uh, how they're all essentially interrelated. Uh, and so the slide simply shows uh, the recent earthquake in Haiti. Uh, the Haiti earthquake uh, occurred uh, on August uh, 14th. And soon thereafter, there was a, a tropical storm grace, or tropical depression grace that went by Haiti. The key thing here to note is that the heavy rainfall areas uh, shown in purple uh, to the left are occurring relatively close to the impacted area uh, where the landslide occurred. And so we had a discussion with uh, Haitian officials as well as Sodima on the likely outcomes of uh, the tropical storm impacting the already uh, earthquake impacted areas. And so we were able to come up with a strategy uh, to deal with this type of multi-hazard event. Certainly we also remember the uh, volcanic eruption uh, of La Soufrière in April uh, of this year and the significant rainfall events that occurred uh, soon thereafter, uh, changing the style of impact and requiring that we look at a multi-hazard uh, impact scenario. In terms of multi-hazard early warning systems, uh, in the region. Uh, one of the best examples uh, is really within the area of climate services where uh, the regional uh, climate center uh, located at CIMH has been actively involved with stakeholder groups and building uh, early warning systems. Uh, this really started to kick off in about 2010 after, uh, well, really during the significant road event that impacted the region. Uh, for the translators, if I'm going too fast, uh, please let me know and I will try to slow down. But the key thing here is that uh, we started to build products and services with the uh, at-risk communities, whether it was agriculture, water, et cetera. We built the, serve the, the products and services together and then we worked with the uh, communities at risk uh, to deliver these services. And then we look for feedback from them with regards to the, the effectiveness of the service that was delivered. And so over the last decade, we've been able to really communicate uh, climate impacts uh, to uh, climate sensitive sectors. And these essentially follow the, uh, the UNDRR uh, information uh, in terms of our, our structure, in terms of risk knowledge, uh, monitoring and warning service dissemination and response uh, capability. The slide on the screen shows the, the, the need for a multi-hazard early warning system and to be really impacts focused. Here on the left, we have uh, the impact of tropical storm Erica on Petit Savant, uh, 30 people missing. People were aware there was a rainfall uh, event are associated with Erica. People did what we all do, 
when there's a rainfall event, we go to our homes. But what if we don't know that our homes are really in extremely landslide prone areas and that the amount of rainfall will trigger a landslide? Is our home really the best place to be? We saw the same thing with uh, Rose Bank in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2013. Five persons killed uh, during the December uh, rainfall event, the Christmas Eve floods. And uh, people again going home, but not being aware of the potential landslide impact that existed. And the slide here just shows that the information did exist for Dominica, where we had high rainfall occur occurring over an area of high landslide susceptibility, but communicating the impact was the weakness uh, in this case. And so we've adopted an impacts-based forecasting approach in the Caribbean region as uh, shown uh, on the screen. It is very, very similar to the WMO framework, the WMO framework on the left and the, the approach used by uh, CIMH and the Caribbean Electric uh, Platform shown on the right, where we integrate the hazards with socioeconomic uh, vulnerabilities uh, and vulnerability data to create a data fusion, which allows us to look at risk and then to be able to communicate that risk to decision makers. The key thing here that I want to highlight though, is that this, it's a data intensive uh, approach. In a lot of ways, it's agnostic to the types of uh, data and the, the types of hazard information that you're looking at. But the key thing here is that it requires data and it performs best in open data environments where you also have uh, real-time data sharing and secure access uh, to data. The worst thing that you want really is an insecure network where uh, persons can uh, interfere uh, with the flow of data. And so the security is important, but most important is access to data to make these platforms uh, work uh, effectively. The figure here just simply shows how we move from the the, uh, the framework to building risk matrices. Most people in the room are going to be familiar with the uh, risk matrices that have been uh, advocated uh, in the impacts-based forecasting uh, discussions and uh, where you have potential impacts and you look at the likelihoods. And from that, you build the risk matrix. And this occurs really within the data fusion uh, area of the platform. Within the, the information dissemination, we start to look at risk levels and we start to talk about response actions related to each risk uh, level. And we've been able to work with uh, partners to start to integrate this within a visual uh, format. But one of the things as we start to build out these uh, environments is the need to some degree to remove uh, some areas of human intervention and try to automate these processes. And so we may start talking about an advanced uh, integrative news, uh, incorporating automated workflows, big data analytics, et cetera. Certainly uh, this, provide, this new slide here pre, uh, provides uh, ways of communicating risk uh, and mitigative response based on the framework uh, that we've discussed uh, on the previous slide. We've started using uh, GIS uh, tools to start to visualize uh, the risk information and to communicate that risk information in a, vis in a visual way. As with all impact-based, uh, sorry, with all ICT-based uh, communication systems, uh, ensuring security, as I pointed out before, becomes uh, essential. But we have been able to do this uh, through the web alert platform connected to the Caribbean Director platform uh, and then try to connect this into a CAP uh, framework. And we have had some success in doing that uh, as well. And this uh, slide simply shows uh, that extension where we are able now to push that information from the Caribbean Director platform uh, into 
the CAP uh, framework. But the key thing here is why we can do this and we can communicate this information through the CAP framework. Really, for this really to work properly, it requires some level of sustainability, a sustainability strategy that allows us to keep building these platforms and improving the platforms, communicating with the public uh, frequently and interacting with the, the public. This requires some level of funding, innovation, uh, public education, public-private partnerships, collaboration, and engagement. And I stress your engagement because we can build the best platforms, but if we're not engaging effectively, the best platforms are never used by anyone. The impact-based forecasting, as I said, is being adopted by uh, the HydroMet community. And this just shows an example of what the Barbados Met Service uh, is doing with their impacts-based forecasting, which has been developed and supported in collaboration with USAID, US Weather, uh, National Weather Service, uh, CIMH, and all through the, the Caribbean Weather and Ready Nations Initiative. I need to compliment the Barbados Met Service on the progress that it has made in trying to get this done and making it work. There is still room to improve, but certainly uh, they have made a good effort to get this up and going. And so they look at a number of hazards, uh, excess rainfall, wind, marine hazards, uh, dust and ash hazards, uh, severe tropical storms and tsunamis. And they have a series of actions depending on the risk level that they have identified uh, for each hazard on any given day or any period of time during the day. And I just showed you the workflow uh, that they use where they start from a number of locations on the island. For example, uh, this may be flooding. They map it through uh, their uh, risk. There is the information on the actions to be uh, undertaken for each risk level. And the figure on the right hand side just shows a flash flood warning for Barbados that they issued on uh, September 26, 2021, uh, where you can see that on the west coast of Barbados, uh, central to west coast of Barbados, there is the expectation of flooding. Uh, to the south of Barbados and to the east, everything is, is fine. And then there are some other areas where the uh, persons were told to be uh, aware, et cetera. And so this whole idea of moving towards the impacts-based forecast platform is proving providing dividends uh, for the Barbados Met Service. Certainly they're moving this uh, web-based information to the CAC uh, framework as well in Barbados. And many people are actually following along what they do, what they're doing and registering to receive the information. The expansion of the IBF to other states is being supported as well through the Caribbean cruise, uh, USAID, uh, US National Weather Service and CDB are among others that are contributing. But we certainly expect that as we move forward that the most states in the Caribbean or all states in the Caribbean will adopt an impact-based forecasting uh, approach, but not just an impact-based forecasting approach, one that integrates multiple hazard, uh, hazards simultaneously and that requires, as I started at, this, at the start saying, it requires a significant amount of integration with different uh, types of hazards, uh, people working across institutions, people understanding workflows and what each institution can provide, and certainly uh, real-time data access and an open data uh, framework if this is going to be extremely successful in the long run. And I would like to finish by thanking everyone for sitting through this. The slides are all available and they, are, they should be quite explanatory. And uh, again, thanks to the development partners and everyone for the support that we've been receiving implementing impact-based forecasting in the Caribbean, uh, in the SIDS that we're located. And I just want to make one final statement. Not every country in the region will have the skill to implement its own impacts-based forecasting uh, solution or manage, 
And that is why it is, it is an extremely important that we have a regional national partnership uh, across the region to help those uh, countries that are not able to do this uh, completely, but that they don't fall behind, and that they benefit from national regional partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. Um, that was very insightful. And I think we will take um, a lot of the messages we heard during the presentation um, for the breakout sessions, and uh, we'll try to connect them during the panel discussion at the end of the, um, at the, end of the event. Um, now um, we are moving to the breakout rooms. Um, all of us will be split in a number of uh, rooms. Uh, some will be in Spanish, some will be in English. Um, this will be taken care of by the organizers. Um, the uh, preliminary time allocated for the breakout session is around 20 minutes, but we will get the notification once the breakout session is about to be over to for us to go back to the main plenary. Thank you very much. It was a very productive uh, discussion. Um, and I think I've, 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 I've I looked at some of the slides. I, I see some are very, very, very packed with like very small fonts. So I hope we'll be able to go through them. So uh, we are now. We'll in the in the usual setting we would do like a, a panel and a debrief and a question and answer. In the virtual world, we're stuck with more slides. So I would want to probably just uh, try to get a quick sense from the groups on the type of topics that have been discussed. Um, let's go to group one. And um, a reporter from group one, would you mind uh, going through the highlights of your discussion presenting key challenges and opportunities? We will probably need, am I sharing the presentation for everyone? And not yet, if you want, I can do it for you. Um, it's okay, I can, I can share it, I have it here. Okay, please, please go. Okay. So, the group. Is it are you are you seeing it? Yeah, perfect. P perfect. So group one, um, who is reporting? And a reporter from group one, please. I guess by default that'll be me. Ah, you could have assigned someone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't assign oh, yeah. anyone. Uh poor leadership. Uh okay, so we spoke about data uh sharing and issues around data data sharing, data collection and data availability, open data access and easy sharing of data. We talked about coordination, uh, which will be coordination between uh, development partners, all stakeholders, and that coordination also would be across technical agencies. We talked about uh, available human and technical capacity being uh, channel challenges. Uh, the limited amount of scientific and technical expertise and it being spread thin. We talked about integrated approaches to hazards. Uh, again, that's related to the integration of human and technical capacity. Uh, engagement across all stakeholders, and that would also feed into communication uh, as well, and bringing everyone uh, together essentially on the big tent. Uh, we talked about uh, strengthening communications, of course, uh, and that's there. Uh, gaps in news uh, policy framework need to be strengthened uh, to provide a common space for common policies to be developed. And we spoke about uh, the nature of financing for EWS and possibly looking at a rebalancing of funding priorities across the pillars. Uh, should I go into opportunities quickly as well, Anna Maria? Uh, yes, please. Okay, and we talked about uh, exploiting tools and initiatives to support risk identification for wider engagement, possible monetizing some of the work to support sustainability, uh, where that is uh, possible. Stronger organizational relationships can come out of this uh, type of a, of a framework and adopt best practices in EWS at local uh, level. Uh, integrating uh, local uh, strategies uh, or community strategies into technical 
strategies to get buy-in and so uh, to build community resilience. And we see those as opportunities once we get impact-based forecasting up and, and running and uh, being uh, uh, adopted as part of standard practice. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, some of these points will definitely resonate with discussions that we had in group two. Um, and Krista will report on behalf of group two. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So I'm going to go to some of the issues that maybe David didn't bring up or, or didn't emphasize as much. One was sustainability. So whether it is data or it's analysis systems or the platforms that we're using for multi-hazard and impact-based decision, they all need to be sustainable. And we have a history in the Caribbean of, of getting funding to start these projects, but then how do we sustain um, these programs? Um, David did mention the capacity development, and especially we were talking as we move to multi-hazard framework. So some of the, the stakeholders might not be familiar with even other hazards that all of a sudden they're responsible for having in this impact-based decision system. Um, another challenge right now is the bottom-up approach. So really how do we hear from those that are going to be responding to these threats so they take the right action so that david mentioned something about you know the, the local level um, there was a good example of jamaica how thresholds will change you know from community to community from region to region um that um one of the challenges that a lot of the impact-based decision um, conversation has been really met oriented and there's a lot of other hazards in the region how do we integrate the earthquakes how do we integrate tsunamis and, you know in some areas where they might not have been considered or even technical uh, and technological type hazards and um Evaluation, um, Japan pointed out the importance of evaluating, you know, this, this continued evaluation of your systems to make sure that it's, it's, it's providing the tools and the, and the, that those products that the, that the communities need. Um, communications was also, you know, people, you know, people that have, you know, that are directed to people also with disabilities or people with lesser um, um, economic resources. So not to leave anybody behind in these impact in these in these these systems that we develop when we talked about opportunities i think we might have had a different gist upon it i think david said what are the opportunities that impact-based decision would give we were talking about what opportunities could we use to develop or support these impact-based decisions so we we recognize that there is some strong um partnerships in the region, WMO, IOC, for example, the tsunami, regional tsunami warning system, SEDEM and emergency management. But also, and, and some of these have already looked at how you go from the regional level down to local level, but that's something that, that you know, is going to have to be strengthened a lot more. Um, regional platforms are, 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 are key and including um, non-climatic hazards um, bring opportunities for a stronger multi-hazard warning system and the inclusion of social science. Thank you very I'll much. I'll stop there. No, that was great. It was very, very to the point. Thank you. Um, we will now move to group three. And I suggest we follow the same approach. Let's uh, specifically highlight the points, those that have not been mentioned before, and maybe reinforce those that we already talked about. So um, reporter from group three, the floor is yours, please. Hi, hello. Yes. My name is Giovanna. And yeah, we were discussing in our group. Sorry, I have something. In, yes, no. Uh, yeah, we were discussing about um, the challenges and the main challenges that our uh, group were talking about was the first of all was the this necessity of Chief of my, the chief of mind that we need to to pass from hazard, and now we need to to think of this um, risk in for in for forecasting instead of hazard forecasting. Sorry, my daughter also wants to participate. No, she should. That's the voice of the youth, please. Yes. Um, children, youth, children, boys. Um, yeah, and then another challenge that was highlighted was the lack of resources for the maintenance of this early warning system. And then the centralization of the information that was uh, highlighted for, uh, from our Paraguayan um, colleague. 
and then the lack of resources also for capacity building and, and how to involve communities and risk in this multi-hazard early warning system. And talking about opportunities, we were discussing about that uh, in this climate crisis context, of, as we are having a lot of uh, extreme events uh, around the globe, we can also um, use this, this um, situation to measure the to measure the effectiveness of the already in place early warning system so i don't know i think this is uh everything that we were discussing um and yep thank, thank you so much thank you and thank you for multitasking that's impressive yes. thank you um the fourth group um i see a lot of challenges were identified <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, due to a timing issue. <laughs> we uh, at first we thought, okay, you no know, further people would join our group, and then all of a sudden we had a lot of people joining the group. So this is why we um, mainly focused on discussing challenges. So also we did not point out uh, a speaker from our group. Um, and I saw that no one answered in the chat. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. Um, so we identified challenges that had been mentioned before as well, but what I would like to point out is um, the challenge of insufficient social data, for example, uh, of groups with uh, special needs, um, and also some baseline information as to smaller communities, for example. Also, um, what has been pointed out is um, we need to um, communicate in a gender differentiated way, and that is a challenge. Um, and yeah, as you can see, we have other challenges that have been mentioned before, like a major emphasis was on capacity and also the lack of data, um, which is yeah, presents a major challenge. On the opportunity side, we said we can, yeah, this will be a good, way when um to for a more robust early warning system i'm sure there are a lot of more opportunities which could have been identified by my group and to everyone uh, you're welcome to contribute in the panel discussion uh, if you identified further opportunities which are not on this slide thank you very much thank you uh, we're moving to group five now, and maybe I would just let's try to see. I see a lot of opportunities in this group, so maybe we can start with this, if you don't mind. Hi, okay. Okay. go ahead, Ron. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly just run it through because I know we're pressed on time. So um, our group basically are the challenges and opportunities centered on people and sort of technology, and they'll be able to the ability to adapt this. So as a sort of quick summary of challenges, we looked at one, the ability to actually um, communicate adequately with different stakeholders. And this is at kind of like government, NGOs, and people on the ground. They need to receive information differently to be able to understand what's, what's happening, okay? And with respect to hazards. Um, two, we're looking at, um, we usually have a lack of coordination in some cases, and we need to bring these various stakeholders together. All right, and this was said by Dr. Farrell uh, initially. And three, with respect to challenges, data is a big thing. We may not have data, or we may have data that may be inaccessible. So one, we need to sort of have a sort of common platform where we could actually sort of know what data is available and have data, be, have people produce data in formats that we could all work with. And this makes it a lot easier to work among um, different groups and organizations. Now, with respect to opportunity, we are looking at, um, again, working, overcoming the issue with, uh, with lack of coordination, bringing all relevant stakeholders. And this is not just people at the top. This is kind of like a top down bottom approach and a bottom up. So we're, we have a really good mix of people there. We need a lot of interagency uh, um, assistance in this. So uh, one of the issues we have with agencies in the Caribbean and elsewhere, it's just that we have everybody doing stuff in silos. And 
you know, well, we have a disaster management agency, but then we have a planning agency that actually has, you know, they, they do some aspects of disasters as well. So we need people, stakeholders across um, the, the, these different agencies to help each other. Standard, standardized data and platforms. Um, one of the, the last two points um, that we'd like to mention is that we need to think about hazards and, and as an evolutionary sort of system. We, we Long at the days, we should be back 10 years ago looking at hazards with the same definition. It's changing. I don't know if we understand that the definition of standards are changing, then the data needs and the modeling um, approaches to accommodate the data will be changing as well. And that will kind of keep us in our P's and Q's, so to speak. And, you know, kids, as we saw with uh, Stephanie, they're a blessing. You know, if we could actually, you know, get this information out at an earlier point in time in the school system, rather than wait until college where everybody's all, you know, like, you know, loaded with work and stuff, we could actually take things and, and you know, make change happen from an earlier point in time. And I think, um, I think that was us there, Sadia, I, I think, Yes, yes, thank you. You did a great job, Ron. I just want to say Ron is actually a modeling, doing a lot of modeling, and he's at university. So I think his insights were very, very good. Thank you. Thank you to my team. Thank you, indeed. It was a, it was a very um, interesting take on the, on the process and on the, uh, the identifying challenges and opportunities. We will move on to group six now. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll be presenting on behalf of my group. Um, apologies for the multi-language um, in, in the slide. Uh, we had both Spanish and English speakers there. So there's like some uh, points in Spanish and some points in English. But um, I think uh, um, a common point that um, everyone agreed on would be um, the communication to the general population to make it uh, a, little, uh, a little bit more simpler. Uh, to also create uh, a platform um, that people can actually access um, uh, information on weather in, in a very in a, in a more uh, efficient manner, so they can actually uh, act on it. Um, also, we discussed uh, quite a bit um, the lack of techno technological uh, capacity in, in some countries in the region. Um, we also mentioned the need to uh, strengthen uh, local capacities. Um, and also education. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, take on, on our challenge there. Um, limited trained personnel, like um, was uh, discussed before, and also a lack of monitoring infrastructure uh, and also need for automated and updated stations. Uh, one of the participants mentioned the, the, the difficulty in, in, in mountainous regions, for example, to have these sort of technologies. So um, that was uh, an interesting take. Uh, on, on the challenges. Uh, on, the, uh, on the opportunity side, um, I think um, we discussed, uh, one of the main two points that we discussed was to create, first of all, coherence uh, and collaboration uh, and also synergies amongst different stakeholders in the country. So um, I think the, the transition from the traditional uh, way into, the, uh, into IBF would be beneficial on that way. So stakeholders are more engaged and, 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 and interlinked. And uh, a very interesting opportunity as well that was raised was also to use and benefit of open source technology um, throughout the adoption of uh, IBF technology. Uh, so um, uh, that was interesting uh, considering the, the, the growing uh, use and also uh, need of open sourcing tools in the region. Um, that was a, a quite, a, quite an interesting take on that as well. So I think that's pretty much the main uh, highlight from my side. Thank you. Thank you, excellent. Um, the next group, number seven, Carlos's yes. report. Yeah, the, uh, this is my colleague Juan Vaso, who will report from our group. He is there. Please, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Ana Maria. Um, so my... my I, I present my uh, group seven. Um, I will change the, the switch in Spanish. Eh, nuestra discusión en nuestro grupo fue eh, ya súper interesante en el sentido de, de los aportes, tanto en la parte de desafíos y oportunidades. Una de las uh, más, 
punto más en común fue la definición de los mandatos, eh, quien, sobre todo la gobernanza y el compromiso de las autoridades para la implementación de Impact Bay Forecasting en los países. Eh, otro punto importante es la dificultad de la evaluación eh, de la exposición y la, vulneral, y la vulnerabilidad, incluyendo eh, la amenaza, definiciones, por ejemplo, de los niveles de impacto, los niveles de riesgo, que estos puedan eh, verse reflejados en los avisos de, de eh, IBF. Eh, otros desafíos están relacionados a las barreras de las capacidades, ¿no? eh, más entrenamiento al personal eh, que elabora este tipo de, de avisos o pronósticos dentro de, lo, de las eh, entidades técnico-científicas. Un desafío más es la estandarización de la información. Veo que también en otros grupos han señalado esto como un desafío importante eh, para eh, tener eh, una eh, base de datos confiables, sobre todo para que sean integrados dentro de, esta, de estos sistemas. Y un punto eh, importante dentro de los desafíos es la articulación eh, de la academia con los tomadores de decisiones. ¿no? Muchas veces... Eh, se ven pasar eh, nuevos gobiernos, nuevas autoridades y eh, estos eh, sistemas eh, no son sustentables con el tiempo. Dentro de las oportunidades eh, hemos eh, visto que una de las principales oportunidades es en la transferencia de capacidades, el apoyo técnico financiero de organizaciones internacionales, sobre todo para la capacitación de las personas que desarrollan estos eh, sistemas eh, una toma de decisión más informada, es decir, cuando se elaboran este tipo de eh, pronósticos o avisos, la, la, el, el tomador de decisión tiene mucho más eh, información que con otros avisos eh, que, que no contienen este tipo de información eh, tan importante. Eh, oportunidad de fortalecer el conocimiento de riesgo, la integración del CAP, del Common Alert Protocol dentro de los mensajes y los avisos, eso también es otra oportunidad dentro de estos sistemas. Y eh, también una oportunidad de poder mejorar eh, los mensajes eh, en un lenguaje común para eh, eh, las personas o los tomadores de decisiones. So. Gracias, Juan. Ahora sentimos que estamos en, en, en la región, finalmente. ¿eh? Um, ok, uh, we're moving to group eight. Nair. Sí, acá, acá estoy Ana María. Y como, como vi que el español te hace mover, entonces voy a continuar en español. Okay. No, nuestro grupo, uh, uh, se hablaron de todos los temas que han hablado ustedes antes, pero me voy a enfocar en aquellos que eh, poco hemos eh, trabajado en este momento. Uno de los grandes desafíos que se ha visto, no solo en los sistemas de alerta temprana actuales, sino también en aquellos que tengan pronósticos de impacto, es que todavía falta eh, eh, algunas consideraciones para los grupos más vulnerables, y sobre todo para grupos en, con relación, por ejemplo, a términos de género. Otro de los temas que se habló son las consideraciones de los recursos financieros necesarios para no solo... Eh, aumentar las capacidades técnicas de las diferentes instituciones y países para hacer sistemas de alerta temprano, sino también poder integrar información de impacto en ellos. Una de las cosas que se habló también es la necesidad que existe de uh, dar mayor claridad a la definición de los eh, sistemas de eh, pronóstico de impacto con relación a los sistemas de alerta temprana eh, tradicionales porque para algunos de pronto todavía existe aquella eh, diferencia en si estamos hablando de dos sistemas diferentes o si estamos hablando de cómo reforzar los sistemas de alerta temprana existentes con información de impacto que pueda permitir una mayor eh, información acerca de la amenaza. Entonces creo que a uno de los grandes desafíos de los cuales se habló es de mejorar el entendimiento de cómo estos IBFs vienen a complementar los sistemas de alerta temprana. Otro de los desafíos que se habló es eh, el enfoque muy reactivo que tiene la región, tanto de América Latina como del Caribe, y que está reflejado tanto en las instituciones como en aquellos que están encargados de, lo, de la reducción de riesgo. El hecho que nuestros países sean muy, tengan una 
un enfoque mucho más reactivo que proactivo y correctivo genera que eh, de alguna u otra manera no se invierta mucho en este tipo de tecnologías o en este tipo de información que puede dar una mayor viabilidad a estos sistemas. El último desafío que se habló es la, 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 la gran, la, el gran problema de cooperación interinstitucional o la falta de ella, que todavía vemos en muchos países, muchas instituciones trabajando en silos completamente separadas sin trabajar con todas ellas, entonces las, las comunidades científicas, por ejemplo, los que se encargan de terremotos, no hablan con los que están encargados de tsunamis o con los que están encargados de deslizamientos de tierra, etcétera, y hay muchas oportunidades que se pueden presentar ahí si hay una mejor cooperación institucional entre ellas. Frente a las oportunidades, pues las oportunidades estuvieron un poco relacionadas con los desafíos, entonces se dice que una información de riesgo puede eh, ayudar mucho para canalizar, por ejemplo, los fondos a las poblaciones más vulnerables, sabiendo cuáles son aquellas que van a ser más impactadas por, la, por, por una amenaza específica. Teniendo un enfoque mucho más proactivo y correctivo de acerca del riesgo, también puede generar que haya una mayor visibilidad de, 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 de los beneficios que hay, uh, los Impact Bay Forecasting pueden traer a las sociedades. De igual manera se habló de que teniendo un, una información de impacto, de pronósticos de impacto, pues puede ayudar a que la gente tenga un mayor entendimiento acerca de las amenazas, ya que no solamente ellos van a hablar de que viene el terremoto y de que viene el huracán, viene el terremoto o viene el tsunami, sino de cómo esta diferente amenaza los va a impactar no solamente en sus vidas, sino también en sus negocios, en sus trabajos, en sus comunidades. Entonces, creo que acá resumí un poco de lo que hablamos en, en nuestro grupo y muchas gracias a mi grupo por, por todas las, las contribuciones. Back to you, Ana María. Gracias, Jair. Um, thanks a lot. Um, I just realized that we're like one hour and 20 into the discussion. We still have close to 70 people online. I think it's a very good um, intermediate outcome of the session. I'm very happy to see that people are, are both connected and actively participating. I will use the opportunity of being moderator of the session to open the floor for any um, questions that um, you would like to ask, um, having the um, very wide range of people on the call um, and, and experiences and having the referral. Um, please um, let us know if, if there are any questions at this point, before we move to the closing and wrapping up of the session. So, Anna. I, yes, I, hi, I, Jeremy. Yes, so I, I, I certainly, um, and you can catch in your wrap up, what you see as the next steps for helping to frame some collaborative action in relation to the challenges and the opportunities. And you may want to speak to how this regional collaboration process will help to drive that. That steering committee on early warning systems, regional steering committee process. Um, how can help to drive those, those, addressing those challenges and those opportunities identified. Sure, if you have any views on that, please share. Okay. Um, if, if you have any immediate views on these topics, feel free to share as well. Well, I, 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 maybe I was really seeking to prompt um, because I know that the, the crews, I, I was probably trying to see how the crews as a key driver in this process sees how it can position that leverage it has to address some of the challenges and opportunities in the partnership within that regional steering space. And if CDM was there, maybe they could draw you and speak into, where do we go from here in relation to what we shared? Jano, I saw your hand was raised. If you want to intervene at this point. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're honored to have um, Jeremy Callimore with us. So Jeremy, to respond to you um, with my question, 
we had an interesting uh, discussion in our group. We had the advantage of having some participants from Canada and participants all the way you know, down to Paraguay. So obviously from very different socioeconomic um, national perspectives. And one of the issues that came up was you know, how to not just install, get the funding to install viable observation networks that can support these impact-based services, but how to maintain them. And there was this proposal sort of put on the table that maybe we should be thinking about how to fund the service rather than how to fund the server, uh, you know, the, the hardware, the software, the nuts and bolts. So it, it made me think about this proposal that we've been discussing in the Caribbean of developing a regional rainfall grid, which would benefit all countries. But what supports that grid, the underlying data, would be satellite data, it would be the radar networks, and it would be whatever the existing observation networks are. But not all countries need to invest to contribute into that rainfall grid, whereas all countries are going to benefit. So going back to this fundamental how to sustain issue, and Dr. Farrell pointed us to talk about sustainability plans, should we be thinking in a service mentality that maybe we should be going to cabinets and national budgets to fund sourcing the data? In other words, it, it's not really purchasing the data, but it's paying for the availability, for example, of data that would come out of a regional rainfall grid. And that sort of subscription to a service could help to sustain the service itself um, and wherever that responsibility lies, you know, whether it's with CAIMH or a distributed network of uh, providers. So I just wanted to pose that question, put you on the floor a little bit, um, Jeremy, but Dr. Farrell, others may like to react to that also. I have yes. probably a couple of minutes for, for some quick reactions, yes, and then we'll have to wrap up by um, in three minutes. I just have one practical um, suggestion, maybe. I, I think the idea, the foundational idea of strengthening multi early warning systems policy is really a critical platform to addressing all the things that we're talking about. And I, I would like to suggest that there be more support for that process, and especially the articulation of the roadmap in which these issues will be shaped. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving some, some endorsement to the work that this, the, the cruise is doing. I'm really urging that we think about it as a critical platform, and we can consider all these issues as we roll that out. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. It really means a lot for the project and, and, and for the team, wide team that works on the project and all the implementing partners are part of this call, a part of this meeting as well. Um, I will, uh, as we are pressed for time, uh, I will have to sadly start wrapping up. Um, I think we will um, use all the channels of communication um, after this meeting to, to stay in touch, to share the views, exchange opinions, etc. Uh, discussion today was fascinating, and even though the term of impact-based forecasting, I think, is in the air for quite a while, um, I would want to go back to what Dr. Farrell said in his opening, that IBF is still relatively new, and as any new instrument, it gives opportunities, it gives opportunities to innovate, it, it gives opportunities to do things better and do things differently. Um, yes, there are a lot of challenges that it poses, the data, the sustainability, capacity, but it also presents a lot of opportunities, uh, of opportunities to build and, and benefit from strong regional uh, partners, from regional platforms. And one thing that I heard multiple times in the reporting of many groups was this need for mental shift for for, for, for vision shift, the, the, the paradigm shift, if you would, if you will, uh, to incorporate behavioral aspects, uh, to give the voice to the community level, to make this process inclusive. I think these are the things that sometimes get shaded by the massive um, 
numbers and, and, and needs and equipments, but ultimately everything has to be done having this in mind. The voice of the community, the voice of the affected people, uh, uh, sectors of economy. And I think today was a very fascinating discussion. Uh, Jair, if you want to say a couple of words at the end, the floor is yours. And uh, from my side, from, from, from behalf of the organizers, I thank all of you for active participation. Thank you, Ana Maria. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Really, it was a very dynamic conversation, not only in the breakout rooms, but uh, also uh, in the chat. I have seen a lot of information passing in the chat that I just take in note, and I really appreciate all of the comments that you are doing, the colleagues from Chima, the colleagues from uh, Noah, the colleagues from different, uh, you know, individuals that are talking about, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, making this uh, disaster risk reduction more sympathetic and less apathic for all of the people working on this area. I guess that, Ana Maria, you resume very good. We need to really focus not only on the technical parts of bringing IBF to a real, uh, to, to be concretized, but also we need the process of, Professor Colimus has mentioned, the process is actually the final product. And in that process, we need to involve communities, vulnerable people, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and we really want to thank you all for attending this, this learning lab. I know that has been a very three days, very intense for of the regional platform. We have more sessions, a lot of sessions that are competing. And I know that for some of you, you would like to take decisions of I go to this one or I go to the other one. So I'm very happy that you took the decisions to come to this one. We take note of this uh, that we were discussed today. As Ana Maria has mentioned, we will integrate all these comments in the roadmap and in the different activities that we are developing in the framework of the Cruz Caribbean Initiative. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the technical team that was behind uh, supporting us. Thank you to the interpreters that I know that is very difficult to, to try to uh, translate also my very uh, long Spanish. And thank you to all and I wish you a very nice day. <laughs>